Um, you know, uh, for the next uh, uh, three weeks, three weeks following, we're going to be lighting uh, candles, and uh, Pastor Alex, the white one, we, la uh, we light last, okay? So just so you know, so we'll light the other ones as we go along. And uh, so, you know, when these guys from Brazil, they have everything backwards, you know what I'm saying? They start backwards. So we're going to get started this morning. And uh, so, um, you know, the three uh, services or the three uh, messages we're going to give in the next uh, few weeks is the, uh, the next one will be Promise Kept, which uh, I'm going to share. And then uh, Jesus, Our Peace, um, Getting Closer to Christmas, and then which Alex, Pastor Alex will share, and then the birth of Jesus uh, uh, on the last Sunday, December 20th, expecting the birth of Christ uh, that requires our adulation. And uh, then, of course, we'll, on that same Sunday, because uh, we won't be doing a Christmas Eve service this year, um, our Christmas Eve dinner, we'll light the, uh, the, the center candle as well. And, you know, for, for thousands of years, the Jews offered um, uh, celebrations. It was in their calendar. And uh, every year they would do seven feasts. They would do the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then the Feast of Sheaths. This was one category. And then as the week, uh, and then 50, uh, um, uh, uh, 50 days later, they would do the Feast of Weeks, which we now call the week, the Pentecost. And then there would be the next category of feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. Now, the meanings and significance of these feasts are an interesting study, and I'm not going to talk about that this morning, but I only bring it up for one reason, and that is that seven times a year there would be a celebration, a feast, to demonstrate the coming Messiah. Every one of these uh, feasts, every one of these celebrations, these ceremonies that they would do had a, a picture of the coming Messiah. And so every year... Uh, seven times a year, the Israelites would have hope would rise up in their heart as they celebrated, as they would see, and they would see the imagery and the shadow, and there was an expectation that one day, one day, the Messiah would come. And the reason, I believe that God did this for a reason. God instituted festivals, and, and so we are preparing our time for the festival of Christmas. And, and we have other festivals in the, in the Christian calendar. We have the Easter is a big one, of course. It's one of my favorites. I love Easter more than I love East, uh, Christmas, actually. Uh, you know, if we could just give presents at Easter, I would really love it then. But uh, no, actually, I love Easter and I love Christmas um, and because it points to the reality of Jesus. And there's other festivals that we do. One of the festivals that our church does every year is family camp. It's a, a week when we get together. Actually, it's four days. We get together and we celebrate together. These are important steps because it inspires hope in us of something greater and something to come. Now, this is what happened in the Israelites and the Jewish people. And uh, you see, because life is, 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 is full of challenges and we need hope. We need hope in the midst of natural challenges or nature challenges, such as fam famine and drought and pestilence. And then we, you know, like these things happen to us. There isn't a person in the world where we don't. And you, right now, of course, we're in the midst of a pandemic and we have pestilence in our, in our world. And then we have, we need hope in, in the light of personal difficulties, like, you know, marriages, um, uh, in our, in our uh, we were children, uh, financial disasters, and, you know, even COVID restrictions. I find that I need hope during this time. And then, of course, we also need hope even in the uh, political uh, realm. Like, we have political upheavals. Um, you know, like some people had all their hope in Trump and others had all their hope in Biden. So some people are going to be disappointed and some people are going to be encouraged. doesn't matter what side you're on. You need hope, though. And, you know, when same as in Canada, you know, we have that democratic process. And, and so, you know, uh, I, and in and, and the days of Israel, uh, they required hope because sometimes a foreign king would take dominance over the country and they would feel this oppression. But saints, they needed hope. A steady 
diet of hope needs to arise in our life for us to function well. And so if you look at the environment, for example, and I've um, got this silly little uh, uh, picture there of uh, Greta uh, Thunberg uh, talking to the Prime Minister, and this was before he grew a beard and became wise like me. And uh, so uh, Greta there is telling him that the world is doomed and that unless we do uh, drastic, uh, take drastic environmental issues, we have no hope in the world. And, you know, I remember in the 80s uh, going to uh, environmental meetings and people telling us that if we didn't act immediately, Vancouver would be underwater. Well, that's 40 years ago, and Vancouver still isn't underwater. And I'm not saying that the environmental issues aren't uh, serious. But what I'm getting at is that there seems to be this uh, catastrophic uh, uh, idea that if, if we don't act, you know, change everything, we're going to be doomed. And this message has been going on for some time, and we haven't been seeing it. But we need hope. We need, we need hope, and I want to speak about that in a second, a little bit more about the environment. But economics, the same thing. You know, there's uh, all through history, all through my life, I remember when I was a kid that, uh, you know, there was this idea that there's no way that we could, uh, uh, that, you know, the economic situation is going to collapse and, and our pensions would be gone. And, and, um, and uh, I remember that at that time, uh, we... They were paying $100 an acre for farmland, $100. I can remember my dad saying to me, you know, that's ridiculous. Who would ever pay $100 an acre for farmland? Well, now, you know, it's over $2,000 an acre and sometimes even more. I just heard that the, where the white spot is in Vancouver, that land sold for $254 million dollars. One little plot of land in the downtown, $254 million. They're not selling hamburgers at White Spot anymore. They decided, uh, you know, with great uh, duress, they decided to sell it instead. <laughs> Go figure, right? <laughs> I, I guess they couldn't figure they could make money selling hamburgers for that kind of money. And, but then the, another aspect of hope that we need is in our personal freedoms. Right now, there's marches in the streets and, and people are really concerned about their personal freedom and, and uh, all of a sudden, in the news, I have never seen so much news today about the Antichrist. Everybody, whether they're Christians or not Christians, they're talking about the Antichrist. Everyone's talking about the Antichrist. 666 has suddenly become a very popular uh, number around the world. And, and, uh, and so people are feeling insecure about their personal uh, health and safety and their security. So we need hope in this area. And then uh, lastly, the perspective of health. You know, there is a, a despair, a hopelessness around this idea. You know, there's nothing that can quash our hope. There's nothing like that can, that can, um, that is an assault on hope as sickness. When you get a sickness, and especially if it's an irreversible sickness, and where you get a diagnosis that you've got uh, terminal cancer, my goodness, that just is an assault. And when, when, when somebody, you know, with people getting an, an MRI or a CT scan, and, you know, the big C word is just in the back of our head, and, and we're just, you know, thinking about it, you know, when sickness knocks at your door, hope needs to enter. You know, it's a crazy thing. Like every single night on the nightly news, you hear 15, 20 minutes of sickness news. People dying. How many cases of COVID? And there seems to be a collective sense that we have lost hope for personal health. And so, folks, since hope is being assaulted on every level, like never before, everyone is looking for a Savior. We want some hope in our life, and so, so we're looking for some kind of a Savior. And I want to say to the church today, I want to say to the saints, whether it's KCF or those that are listening um, that are outside of our church family body. By the way, if you are listening and you're outside of our church family, why don't you just drop us a note? Just right in there in the Facebook page or send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. But here's the deal. 
the world is set up right now for the Antichrist. Somebody that would come along and say, I've got an answer. I, 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 can, I can make a solution for you. I, I've got a, a, a piece right here that will solve your anxiety level and bring you to a place of hope. Now, it's what's, what's really interesting is this, is that amongst many Christians, I'm seeing this, instead of, you know, uh, the events of the day, instead of inspiring a hope, there's a sense of despair and hopelessness. And, and, and I think the, the narrative should be just the, exactly the opposite. I think we should be excited about what's going on in the world today. I think we should say, God is at work. I think we should say that we should say, look at this. The, the, these events that are taking place today are a, a precursor of what God wants to do in our world. He wants to, you know, he wants to bring uh, people to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And, 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 and he, he, um, he wants us to, to come to a place of hope where God is our Savior, not some false Christ or some antichrist or some vaccine or some kind of political solution or some kind of economic uh, solution. I want to tell you today that Christmas is one of those celebrations that points to our true hope and that is Jesus Christ. He was born as a servant to serve humanity. But Christmas also speaks that he's coming back as a conquering king. Hallelujah. Where death shall be no more. Sickness shall be uh, taken care of. Health and prosperity shall be flowing in the earth to every single human being that has given their heart. To Jesus Christ. Oh, I'll tell you, this is a great time. This is a great time. You know, the first time Jesus came as a suffering Savior, but this time he's going to come as a king. And as, as our king, here's the thing, and this is what, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about hope this morning. And you see, if Jesus is your king, we can expect him if, to take care of the earth. Do you know that the earth is his creation? And there's this wringing of the hands. Oh, what's going to happen? I want to tell you that God loves his creation. He loves his earth. He loves the beauty. And, he, and, and the other thing, saints, he's expecting us to do our part. He wants us to be in cooperation with God. And as we do our part, we can have hope in the creation that God has made us. Well, what about... The, the, if he, Jesus is our king, did you know that Jesus is our king? The, we don't understand kingdom uh, very much because we live in a democracy. But the king, if he was a good king, would take care of his subjects. The subject would be prosperous. You know that Jesus promised that he would provide for us. He's a king that wants to provide for us as long as we do our part. If we are in partnership with God and, 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 uh, and, uh, and follow the principles of God's word, God makes this promise that he'll provide for us. Hallelujah. And so if you're out there today and you're worried about your financial future, I want to tell you that you can rise up with hope in your heart knowing that there's a God in heaven whose name is I shall provide. That's his name. And then we look at the areas of, of, um, of where we are, uh, uh, a sense our personal security is in China. Cha uh, challenged you know we're, we're we're worried now i mean there's so much uh you know people's rights my rights and they're worried about their rights and and you're not going to take my rights from me and and and, and people are so afraid i want to tell you that we have a king who promises to protect us i i, I want to encourage every single person out there listening to me today i want to tell you it, that you've got a king you've got a lord in heaven a god who is our protector? And then lastly, I want to talk about our health. You know, we're, uh, we're, uh, hope has been assaulted by the uh, events of the day. But I tell you that if we will take care of our body, in other words, if we will do what we can do, God makes this promise, I am your healer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I, I, I believe this with all my heart. 
I'm not walking around in fear. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. You know, I'm wearing my mask in and, and public places and doing all the things that I'm supposed to do. But ultimately, here's the thing. The reality is this. Ultimately, whether it's our economics, whether it's our personal safety, whether it's our personal health, or whether it's, um, you know, the environment, ultimately, there are factors that we don't have any control over. None. You have your pit, your bit, your piece. That's what you have control over that. But there's a whole lot of life that <laughs> you have no control over. And that's where we have to put our faith and trust in God. God is our hope. Now, people need to hear this. This message Everyone needs to hear this, that there is a God in heaven that you can trust, that you can put your hope in. I want to look at this scripture, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. It says this. See, see, church, we have to believe this message. If there is any people on the earth, it should be the saints that are looking to the coming Christ at Christmas, this Messiah that was born in a manger, that this is our great hope. And it says in Hebrews chapter 11, now faith is being sure of what we hope for. And certain of what we do not see. And then in verse 2, it says, this is what the agents were commended for. And then it gives you a whole list in Hebrews chapter 11 about all those that did great things because they had faith. In other words, they knew where their hope was. You see, we are only credible, saints, listen to me, we are only credible if we're living out what we believe in our life. People don't care about how eloquent you are or how, you know, intelligible you are or your fine-sounding arguments. What they want to see, <laughs> are you living out what you believe? Are we people of hope? Are we people that believe what we preach? You see, Look at Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. If you've got your Bible with you or your phone and open up in your app, Isaiah, I'm, actually, there's a couple of verses in Isaiah chapter 30 I want to look at this morning quickly. Um, and says, in Isaiah 30, it says, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. Listen to this. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But everybody say with me, with me but you would have none of it. That's, that is exactly a description of our culture. In repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. I think this speaks to two groups of people. It speaks to the group of people that are in the Christian community, that are militant, that are sprawling for a fight, that are refusing to wear a mask, that want to continue to have their parties and rebel against government, requesting, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, they 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 want to they want to uh, they want to fight instead of quietness and rest, trusting God. There's a militancy right now that's happening in the Christian community. And the community is being divided. Christians are being divided over something that I feel is not essential in our Christian faith. The second group of people that this is speaking to is those that are outside of Christ that want nothing to do with repentance and salvation. They, they simply want to run their own life. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But let me talk about the first part here about the Christian community. Saints, this is not a time to, do, to be divided. It's a time to be united. And I believe that Paul, the apostle, taught this principle in Romans chapter 14. And it is applicable to this situation. 
So in chapter 14 of Romans, if you turn in your Bible there, uh, or open it up in your app, in your phone, I really encourage everybody to get an app in your phone. I take my Bible with me everywhere I go because it's on my phone and it's just awesome. Um, and Romans chapter 14, he says it there, he says, Accept him whose faith is weak. What? What does it say? Without passing judgment on disputable matters. Do you think there's a little bit of judgment being passed out right now on a disputable matter? Some people are pro-masks. Some people are anti-masks. Some people are pro-lockdown. Some people are anti-lockdown. Romans chapter 14, at the end of the chapter... He, he lays that out at the beginning. In the end of the chapter, he says, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to conflict. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't say conflict. It says what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of masks. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. It says for the sake of food. Because you see, the Apostle Paul was dealing with a relevant subject of the day, but God's Word it transcends. We have to look at culture. So in our culture, uh, whether you're a vegan or not, really doesn't have a whole lot to do with, spirit, uh, with you know, the Christian community. is not divided about this. It doesn't have uh, too much spiritual significance. But what's happening right now in our culture is that the Christian community is having a big fight over whether they should wear a mask or not. And so he says in this, in this context, I just want you to kind of transpose this scripture into our relevant culture for the day. He says, all food is clean, but it... It is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. So if, 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 if your actions are causing someone else to stumble, somebody who is weak, let's say. So let's say you're really spiritual and you say, you know what? Praise God, you know, I'm immune from all sickness and disease. Jesus is my health and my strength. And all this is just a conspiracy anyway. So I'm not, so I am not going to wear a mask. But now you come into the context of somebody else who doesn't have this super spiritual idea, now you're causing that other person to stumble. Why not show respect? Why not show love? Put on the mask. And then, when you're by yourself, take the mask off. Don't worry about it. He says, Paul says, it is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. You see, what, what are we hearing right now from the Christian community? My rights. <laughs> You're not going to take my rights away from me. My rights. I thought that we were slaves of Christ. I didn't think we had any rights. Hello, anybody out there? How, how is this? How is this all of a sudden that we have all these rights? Saints, here's the thing. I'm not going to labor on this point, but I want us to have hope. Wearing a mask is not an assault on your faith. When they want me to reject my faith, when they didn't want me to deny Christ, when they refuse me the right to share the gospel. You see, some people say, you know, there's a, there's a big movement right now about we shouldn't shut churches down. And, and uh, Pastor Alex and I and our staff we, um, and even our, our council, we had a big discussion on this. Is this the right thing to do? Should we... Uh, defy the government order? You see, they haven't asked us to stop preaching the gospel. And the moment the government or any human being wants me to stop preaching the gospel, you'll see me leading the charge against it. When we were planting the church in Crawford Bay, um, we were preaching the gospel. And there was great opposition from 
doing, sharing the faith. And one day, a gentleman came to my work site. And he told me, he says, you got to stop preaching the gospel if you don't stop. This is a real story in Crawford Bay. This gentleman said to me, if you don't stop preaching the gospel, I'm going to beat you up. And then he grabbed me by the, by the shirt. He slammed me up against the wall. And I looked him in the eye. And I'm not saying this with any kind of bravado or, or you know, pride or anything else. But something came over me. And I had this calmness. And I said, well, sir, you might as well beat me up now. Because I'm not going to stop preaching the gospel. And you know, God gave us a church that's still functioning in Crawford Bay because we didn't give up. And that is what I'm talking about, folks. I'm talking about when we, to wear a mask or not to wear a mask, it's not an assault on my faith. The moment that we have this edict that comes across, you'll hear me leading the charge. But to, I want to speak to the second group, those that don't have faith in Christ. You may be listening to this, this morning and, and uh, you know, wherever you are in your living room, in your pajamas, with your hair messy. Praise God, you know, that's one good thing about, you know, church online. Uh, just, just so you know, at KCF, you can come in your pajamas, and you can have your hair messy. And uh, if you're worried about your hair, you can also shave it if you want. So, but if you're listening to me this morning, and hope does not in your heart, hope does not live in your heart, but you instead, you're trying to put hope in things like the vaccine or, or the government or even your own ability. I commend you for that. <laughs> I think, why? You know, you've got some resilience inside of you. You've got, you know, your hope. You've got, your, 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 you've got hope in yourself, and, 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 and there's a measure of good in that. And you've got hope in the vaccine. That's good. And you've got hope in the government. Okay. But let me tell you, your hope is fragile. <laughs> Very fragile. Because it's dependent. It's dependent, folks upon you it's dependent upon circumstances it's dependent on your personal ability and strength it's dependent upon all kinds of things which you have ultimately no control over it's fragile i've got a better plan for you look if you're back in isaiah chapter 30 look at this it says in verse 18, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion for the Lord God, for the Lord is the God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. You see, in that scripture, there is a, a truth. Oh, saints, if we can just get this revelation in our heart this morning, that God longs for you. You know, he longs for you. He, 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 he's longing. He said, oh, if, if George would just come to me. Oh, if Martha would just come to me. I, I just want to pour my life into her. He longs for us. Hope and waiting go hand in hand. When I hope, when I've got hope in my life, I can wait. <laughs> the moment I lose hope, waiting becomes impossible. Then I give up. The first step in psychology of helping someone is to give them hope. Because once we have hope, we can withstand all kinds of difficulties, all kinds of pressures, all kinds of challenges. We can, we can uh, uh, withstand the most horrendous things in our life. We can wait in it 
when we have hope. Because we think that there's a better day. There's light at the end of the tunnel. I have a, we, it's kind of a funny thing in our office. Uh, you know, we, we take on a big project and then we work like crazy and then we think, okay, Lord, just get me through this project and then, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take on another, I, I'm going to, you know, just get me through this one more project. Right? And then we get through that project. Whew! Okay! And we feel good for a day and then we go, oh, we can take on another one now. We trick ourselves. But you know, the prophet Jeremiah, he's called the weeping prophet. You see, the weeping prophet, if you, if you read the book of Let Jeremiah, I probably, I, I, I go through the Bible now, I've got a program that I'm going through the Bible like every three months, from Genesis to Revelation. And so I'm going through Jeremiah, you know, a lot. It's probably my worst I don't like Jeremiah. He, he, you know, I mean, it's tough, Jeremiah. It's just one great big weep. Complaining the whole time. Because people won't repent. And there's trouble in the land. And, 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 uh, and he wrote a book called the Book of Lamentations. Do you know what that word lamentations means? Weeping. Book of sorrows. A book of weeping. And when you read it, You'll quickly see the book of Lamentations, uh, you know, that is just one great big weep, crying. But in the middle of it is chapter 3. And if you take time to read chapter 3, and I won't take time this morning to read it for you. I was going to read it, but I won't take time to read it this morning because of time's sake. But I want to encourage you to read it, uh, chapter 3, because he gives a whole list. I mean, he, he says... He, he is, it is a picture of discouragement. I mean, this is the most discouraged guy I have ever heard in my life. And, 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 and he, he, he goes down, and if you look in that, in verse 17, he says, I've been deprived of peace. I've forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone, and all that I had hoped for had hope from the Lord, is gone. He was hopeless. Then in verse 19, he says, I remember my afflictions and my wandering, the bitterness, uh, 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 gal, um, and, and I'll remember. And then he says, and my soul is downcast with me, within me. Now, this guy's depressed. But in verse 21, now, I really want you to look at verse 21. And if you could just turn in your, in your Bible, or, or I, I think um, um, Sam's going to put it on the screen there. In verse 21, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Listen, saints, if you're listening to me today and hope seems to have dissipated from your heart, you don't have hope anymore. Maybe you don't have hope in your future for economics. or Maybe you have, don't have hope in your relationships anymore. Maybe you don't have hope in your job. Maybe you don't have hope in your health and you're feeling like there's no hope in your health anymore. You don't have hope in the government. I want to tell you four things that you can do to let hope arise in your heart. You see, when you read chapter 3, I tell you, most of us in North America here don't have it as bad as Jeremiah. <laughs> I mean, you look at what Jeremiah's going through, man. Uh, there's one portion in that uh, chapter 3 it talks about, he says, he says uh, uh, my teeth feel like I've been eating gravel. I'm going, woo, <laughs> this is really bad. He says four things there 
in verse 21, starting at verse 21. He says the first thing, he says, call to mind. Call to mind. In other words, begin to think about the times when God answered your prayer. Think about that Jesus is alive. Think about Christmas. We think about that Jesus was born to bring hope into the world. Think about that Jesus hears our prayer. And then begin to think about all the times that God actually answered your prayer. You see, isn't it funny that, you know, God can answer a prayer and then a new challenge comes and we forget all about that, what he did before. We need to meditate on this. Think about it. And then, you know, think about the times that God has worked in your life. Begin to meditate on these things. You know, see, because God made this promise that he would bring justice, that Jesus is coming again. Oh, I need to remind myself every once in a while that Jesus is still in charge and he's coming back. And then he says, they are new every morning. Just like the sun's going to come up. I guess it's from the east here. And it's going to go down in the west. His faithfulness is for us. So meditate on these things. And then the second point he says in verse 24 of that uh, 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 chapter 3 verse 24, he says speak it out. Speak those promises. You know it's one thing to meditate on and to think about it. But the moment that we begin to speak it out, I, I love speaking out words of faith. Some of you will, will remember uh, you know, uh, sometimes I'll make a declaration. I'll say, this is what God wants to do. And then later on, we see God actually doing it. Speak those promises out. And then the third thing in verse 25, he says, seek the Lord. Seek God. Take some time. Begin to pray. You see, because when we're going through a challenge, there's God maybe. Well, every time you go through a challenge, he's, he's uh, strengthening us and he's teaching us and he's showing us things. But find that time. To seek God. And then lastly, which is probably the most difficult, is wait. Wait for God. Wait for God knowing that He is faithful and just and that He always answers our prayers and that we can rest in Him. We can hope in Him. Saints, this is my prayer in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. As we look to Christmas, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in Him. Did you get that? As we trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope. <laughs> we should be the most hopeful people because God is on the throne. Jesus came to the earth as a child. He lived for us. He died for us. And he is the conquering God still today. May this God, may we have overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Brad's going to sing us a song as we conclude our worship this morning. And I want to talk to you this morning as we're getting ready to do that. Because you see, whether you are a person of faith in Christ or you're not there yet. That's okay. He, God is longing to touch you today. And I want to ask you as a point of contact. If you would put your hand over your heart this morning. Right where you are. Doesn't matter where you are this morning. Put your hand over your heart. And say, God, through the person of Jesus Christ, would you enter my life? May hope arise in my heart as I do those four things. As I w meditate on what you have done and what you're going to do. As I speak the truth, the Word of God. As I seek you today and tomorrow. And lastly, Lord, I make a commitment to wait for you to bring about your promises in my life. Lord, let hope arise in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, folks, if you've done that this morning and you've never 
prayed to Jesus before, I'd love to hear from you. Would you write me a note? Send it on Facebook or a private message and let us know. And we would love to pray with you and just help you to know how you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and that hope would always live in your heart. Amen. God bless you. Open
So as we uh, conclude uh, this morning's uh, message, uh, we invite uh, you all to reach out to our office and just to connect with us. God bless you. One thing that I want to just share with you before we say goodbye, we have a great testimony, and that is Monday we're going to be pouring 200 meters of cement. We're going to be pouring the third floor of our housing project. Uh, and uh, all November was, was supposed to be snowing. And you guys, we've been praying in our church that we wouldn't get snow in November. Uh, and it, it didn't. It was forecast to. And it just the weather has shifted. And uh, so now uh, the uh, enemy is trying to give me a little bit of uh, anxiety because it's forecasted for rain and snow on Monday, the day of our pour. And every day after that till, till the mid of December, uh, it's supposed to be sunny. So I'm thinking, no. <laughs> No, 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 no. You know, you're not going to have sunny all November and then all December, but one day it's going to rain. So we're going to pray. Could you pray with me one more time that, uh, Father, we just ask you, Lord, uh, we don't mind if it snows on the ski hill because people want it to snow there. We don't care if it snows uphill because I know people bought a new snowblower and they want to use it uphill. But we don't want to snow here, right on this property. And, Lord, we ask you, Lord, to hold it back so we can pour this floor in uh, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Love you all. We'll talk to you later. Bye.